And welcome to Stork, the podcast in which we explore the many ways to build and define family. This is your host, Julia. And today I'm going to introduce you to Yvette Anderson, who among so many other things is a mom and the founder of this really impressive organization that serves so many. And we're going to talk about the origins of that organization and how it came as sort of calling. She actually calls the genesis of this organization, a message from God, a service mission, turning tragedy into triumph. And that's so beautiful. Why is it tragedy to triumph? Because Yvette, in addition to being a mom of a now grown daughter, is also a lost mom, which means that she lost an infant at a very early age. This episode has a trigger warning. Yvette is a tremendous storyteller, and you're going to hear her voice come through so beautifully. And you're going to hear that the two of us spent the entire recording pretty much bawling. So my questions are asked through sniffles and hers are responded in some cases through sniffles. There were a couple moments in the episode that really continue to stick with me, continue to live in my heart. And one of that is this moment where she, Yvette, looks at her grown daughter and has to say goodbye because she's going in for an emergency C-section and she doesn't know if she's going to live, she's going to make it through. And imagine that moment of saying goodbye to one child so that you can try and save another, the one that's currently in your womb. She also describes the precise moment that she watched her son pass away. And that is powerful. This story is not just about losing her son, although it is mostly about that. It's also about preeclampsia and how dangerous that is for the mother. In Yvette's story, you're going to hear that she almost lost her own life. She had a very near-death experience, and she spent months, months in the hospital trying to recover. One of the things you'll hear her doctor say is that it was his obligation, his duty as her doctor to save her life. And that was true at the time that she gave birth to her son, And it may not still be true under today's political climate. And I will leave that thought with you here as you listen to Yvette's episode. So if you want to hear a wonderful episode about turning tragedy into triumph, about creating an amazing organization from the raw pain of loss, and Yvette's story of losing her son and almost her own life due to preeclampsia, this is your episode. Like all episodes of Storked, please share it with somebody who could benefit from it. Don't forget to give us a great review wherever you listen to podcasts and sign up for our newsletter. I am so, so excited to invite Yvette here today to talk to us about her family building journey and this incredible organization she has started. And we're going to jump right in. Can you tell us a little about yourself? Sure. Hi. Thank you for having me. My name is Yvette Anderson. And I am the founder and executive director of MTN Organization, which is a nonprofit. It's located in Freehold Borough. We do nine projects of promise a year and also a free food pantry and a prepared meal distribution. We started that during COVID. And it's a wonderful opportunity for families in need or those struggling with food insecurity to get the things that they need. And I'm so excited because your organization is literally to help families. You know, there have been times when we were in communication and you said, no, I've got a big pallet delivery of all this food coming. And so you're working to make sure that families are taken care of. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that looks like? What a project of promise is? What is it like to run a food pantry for all these members of the community that need your help? So our nine projects of promise are annual projects. So we start in January with Friends Feed Homeless, and that's where we do about a thousand care packages. And we go across New Jersey feeding those, we call them our neighbors without an address. Them everything from one blanket to hats, gloves, scarves, socks, a bag of lunch, and toiletry. So it's an awesome day of giving. Our volunteers love it. Then we move from that to gear up for our packs of success. Packs of Success is our backpacks filled with school supplies, and that's where we want to give students that are in need the opportunity to start their school year off successfully, so they get a backpack filled with all the essentials needed to have a great start to their school year. Once that is finished, we are like in full steam of head, and we go right into Thanksgiving, and that's where we do about 900 families, where they receive a 32-quart tote filled with all the essentials needed to make a proper Thanksgiving dinner, including a gift card to purchase a turkey. 
once we finish that, then it's right onto RJ's toy chest, which is near and dear to me because RJ's toy chest honors my son that I lost in 2014. And this year we did about 1900 kids. So it was awesome every year to be able to, you know, honor his little life in such a big way. So it's ongoing. It's a full year of giving. And then of course we have the weekly food pantry, which happens every day for those that need groceries and Tuesdays and Thursdays, families can come out and receive prepared meals. So last year we did about 39,000 families. Oh my God. So first of all, I want to just highlight like the numbers you're talking about are bananas. 39,000 families, 1,900 toys. 900 families for Thanksgiving. Okay. So, you know, cooking or providing one family with a Thanksgiving meal is hard enough, but providing 900 Thanksgiving meals. And so what I'm hearing is, and I'm getting chills because we're talking about providing the fundamentals for family. We're talking about making sure that you have a physical security, that you have food, that your child can learn, and that you have the opportunity to create moments, shared moments of joy. That's right. right. So for me, this is something that I grew up a family in need. So starting this, I did not ever imagine that it would be a nonprofit organization to this magnitude. It was just something that I wanted to pay forward to a couple of families. And I was raised by my grandparents and they always instilled in me that, you know, always help anyone that you can. You never have too much or too little to be a blessing to someone. And my grandfather would have me go out and volunteer at a local church and they would build these Thanksgiving baskets. And back then they would put them in a cardboard box and, you know, it was just canned goods and, you know, essential items to help a family in need have some food. And I went to my husband and I said, here it is, you know, you fast forward, we both have great careers, we want for nothing. How can I do something for struggling families? And he said, sure, let's do it. So we started out doing about 15 families. And the need just grew greater than we could produce. So our blueprint is large and it's an amazing thing to do, to be able to, you know, see a need and fill it. And I remember thinking about the name for my organization and driving in the car. And I was very small back then. And I said, you know, praying in the car saying, Lord, I want to be like a -a Make-A-Wish Foundation. I want to be like the Salvation Army. And how do I have a name that means something? And this little voice was like, what is it that you want to do? And I said, I want to meet the need. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's it. Meet the need. (laughs) I want to meet the need of those who need it the most. And that's what stays with me. And that's what drives me and fuels me. I love that. I love the meet the need. And you're talking about big needs. But I also love that the shorthand for it is MTN, which to me reads mountain. And so it feels to me like not only are you meeting the needs, but you're just moving mountains on behalf of these families. Oh, I love that. I love that. I never even thought about it like that. But yes, I like that. (laughs) When you say your story too, that you came from a family that had some needs, it also feels to me like you've scaled the mountain on behalf of other people. Would you be open to talking about your experience as a child growing up in a family that had some needs and, and growing up with your grandparents? What was that like? My mom had me when she was 19. And I remember being as a child, being in the house with my mom and her sisters. And they're like sisters to me because they're not much older than I am. Uh, Her youngest sister is 10 years older than me. So I just remember growing up in a very loving family in a house that was small. There were three rooms. And as I just did, my mom has six sisters. (laughs) And a brother. And I just remember, although it was a very small house, it seemed so big to me back then, you know, and it was just always filled with love and it was always filled with wisdom. And I had six mothers, you know, on top of my grandmother being the matriarch of the family. And although she was my grandmother, I referred to her often as my mom. And it was just an awesome family to grow up in because my family dynamic was we had humble beginnings. But if you look at everyone in my family now, everyone is super successful. And I attribute that to my grandparents because those are the values that they instilled in us growing up. And I just remember my grandfather always saying that a closed fist never receives. So always keep your palm open, ready to give, and then you will receive. And it's just the little learning lessons and the little nuggets of wisdom that he you know, instilled that I find myself referring to now as an adult. Well, so one of the projects that has a lot of meaning for you is the one named after your son, RJ. (laughs) Can you tell us a little bit about the son for whom it was named? So RJ's Toy Chest 
It was kind of birthed after I lost my son. My husband and I went through seven years of IBS. And it was devastation after devastation, you know, just learning that, no, it didn't take this time. No, it didn't happen this time. And it's just disappointing to hear those words because you get your hopes built up so high that this time it's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. I feel it. I know this is the time. And I also had a lot of issues around getting pregnant because I had, I suffered from fibroids. So even trying to do IVF, I went through several surgeries to remove fibroids. And one of the last attempts before RJ, I had to have the fibroids removed because they were afraid that they were going to attach to my walls, the uterine. And if that happened, then of course that would mean having a hysterectomy and then that would just deplete everything. And before Um, we go further, would you be willing to share with us a little definition of fibroids and what the surgical experience was like for you? Okay, so there are these growths that happen within your uterus, and sometimes they can be just as small as a pea. Other times they can grow as large as a grapefruit. And for me, I had multiple fibroids that were, some were small as lemons, some were the size of a baseball, and they had kind of taken up a lot of the space in my uterus. And it's amazing to me that you're saying small as lemons, because lemons are not small. (laughs) But, you know, that's a smaller scale. That's something, you know, you can work around. But when you get as big as a grapefruit, you know, then you got some serious things happening. And I had multiple sizes and just multiple fibroids. I had surgery that was invasive and then some that was not so evasive. So I've had it where it's gone through my belly button and it was more laser. And I've also had where, you know, they had to make incisions and open me up and actually physically remove them. So it was an ongoing battle for me over the span of me trying to get pregnant, but we were just determined to do everything that we could to make the pregnancy happen. And even there were times where my husband would be like, okay, that I think we should just stop, you know, like it's too much for you. And I don't know your listeners, anyone who has gone through IVF, you know, that your husband giving you the injections, (laughs) it's gruesome sometimes. So for seven years, you can only imagine all these knots that I had forming on my body from just trying so hard. And we did all these creative things where we moved from his insurance to my insurance, because at times you're only only allowed to have three attempts. So year after year, we were like bouncing back and forth to each other's insurance. And we depleted a lot of our savings in these attempts. And after they finally got my uterus clear, and here's like my fifth attempt at having IVF, I finally took. And we were just elated and we were just so excited. And I had been praying for this for seven years. And at that moment, I was just like, God, I know that you hear me. I know that you're going to answer my prayers. I truly believe that, you know, you're going to allow us to have a son. And for Reggie and I, we have two daughters and we don't use stepchildren in my family. Him and I both had our daughters young. They're three years apart. And when we got married, we did a blended family. And we exchanged rings with our daughters. And it was something that was extremely special. (laughs) Wait, you exchanged rings as part of the marriage ceremony with your daughter? Because we weren't just married to each other. He was marrying my daughter and I was marrying his. And we wanted them to be a big part of our ceremony that this family is always going to be one. There is no stepchildren. There is no stepdaughter. You're just my daughter. And we're just a family. And it was big to the girls. Like they loved it because they each got rings. We said vows with them. They exchanged vows with us. And we exchanged vows as a family on how we were going to support and be there for each other. Here we are. We have a beautiful family. We have two beautiful daughters. And neither of us had been married before. And we said, we want to experience it different. Reggie had his daughter at 19. I had Jasmine at 24. So we wanted to, you know, experience having a child together, married. And that would have been a huge age difference between the girls, but they were very excited about, you know, us having another child come into the family. And it was devastating, you know, when it all ended for all of us. What happened is I ended up having severe preeclampsia at 22, 23 weeks. And I get this phone call that says, I knew that something was out back. I knew something was happening because my ankles had started to swell. But you don't really pay any attention to that because you realize that you're pregnant and these are normal things that happen during a pregnancy. Your body starts to swell and it traveled from my ankles and it went all the way to my knees and my legs were just very huge. 
And I went to the doctor and they ran all these tests and they said, okay, we're going to take you out of work for a couple of days. And we just want you to have some bed rest and stay off your feet. They tested me for preeclampsia and it came back that there was no protein in my urine. And then it starts going up my legs even higher. So it's now beyond my knees. As I'm laying in bed, it's now moving into my thighs. My face is starting to get a little full. My hands and my arms are starting to get full. And I went back to the doctor and he says, we're going to test you again, but this is going to be, you know, a more intense. We're going to not test your urine just once. We're going to have you do it over a weekend. So me and my husband went through that weekend of collecting urine for this test. And that came back that I had no protein in my urine. And what's going through your mind at this time? Your body's probably not feeling very comfortable if you're yeah. swelling up like that. So you're probably feeling a little bit of pain if I'm going to make a projection. And then the doctor's having you do a significant test. What are you thinking and feeling at the time? I am praying like crazy. And I am asking God to make sure that nothing happens to my baby, that he's safe, that he's healthy, that he's going to be born a healthy, happy, beautiful baby. We've come this far. I know that this is it. Like nothing's going to happen to this pregnancy. This is a promise that, you know, you gave me that I would have a child and I'm standing on that and I'm scared. And I know for me, I'm a very religious person and I trust and believe God with all my heart. And I know that he does not give us a spirit to fear, but I was afraid and I'm human, you know, and fear kicks in and you just want things to work out. But I was just so gung ho on the fact that this pregnancy this is it. Like I waited seven years for this. Nothing's happening in this pregnancy. This is the pregnancy that God promised me. So I'm not going to pay attention to any of these things. I'm going to be fine. The baby's going to be fine. And it was like, my faith was being increased because each time I took one of these tests or went through it, it came back that it was negative. So then that just filled me up to say like, okay, see, I knew it. I knew it. Nothing's wrong, you know? And so now I'm home and I'm at bed rest and I get this phone call on my birthday. And it's like seven in the morning. And my doctor says, Yvette, he goes, I hate to do this to you, but I need you to come and admit yourself into the hospital. And they did not say that I had preeclampsia at that point. They were thinking that I had something wrong with my kidneys. So we get up and we go, mind you, this is my birthday. (laughs) That's the uh, worst birthday present uh ever is a, a phone call like that. And we stay there for the complete day. They run all these tests on my kidneys. There's nothing wrong with my kidneys. So Reggie and I, the week before we had gone and they were telling me that RJ was not growing. And then he was off minuscule amounts. It was very slight. It wasn't anything to be alarmed at. So we knew also that that was in the background. It was a concern that we were going to be watching over the next you know, couple of weeks. So once they ruled out that I did not have any kidney issues or anything like that, then my specialist came to see me and it was found that I had severe preeclampsia and that I needed to be transferred from the hospital that I was in to a specialized hospital. So I was moved from Centra State to Robert Wood Johnson in New Brunswick because they felt that they were better equipped to handle should anything happen. And so it was like, from this point on, kiddo, unfortunately, you're going to be here for the duration of your pregnancy. So I was positive that, you know, I'm going to think positive. I'm still in that mode of, you know, nothing's going to happen. You know, I'm just going to be in the hospital. This is great. I'm going to have bed rest. And I get to Robert Wood Johnson and the doctor that was on call that night took one look at me and he goes, and I'm right now, I'm probably looking like the Michelin man, just to give your audience an idea of what I'm looking at right now. My body is swollen all over my arms, my face, my legs. And he says, if it were up to me, I would take your baby now. And those are the words that he used with me. I would take your baby now. And I'm like, wait a minute. Like they told me that I was just coming here because you're better equipped to handle the situation that I'm just going to be here for the duration of my pregnancy or until my son is born. Nobody said anything about taking my son tonight. And he goes, ma'am, you have severe preeclampsia. He goes, you can look at you and tell that. So his bedside manner was just awful. And Hardwood Johnson is like a teaching hospital. So mind you, here I am, I'm coming in, I'm trying to stay positive. I'm holding on in threads and he has 12 students with him and they're all looking at me, probing and picking at me. And I just got here and I don't even know what to expect. I don't have any preconceived notions in my head of like, I'm in danger, my baby's in danger. It's like, you know, we're just gonna give you some bed rest and you're gonna be watched and monitored. And this is a good thing for me. And the first moment that I'm there, I get hit with that. So immediately, of course, I start crying and I get very, very emotional. 
Of course. I mean, I'm getting emotional just hearing how horrible some of the doctor's bedside manners can be, right? The Mm -hmm. language that he's using is aggressive Mm -hmm. language. The fact that he's saying it in front of his students, the fact that he's not letting you breathe and settle in and check in. And was your husband with you at the time? Did you have anyone advocating with you or for you? This is so crazy because like I said, when we left Centra State, they were just saying that they were moving me to Robert Wood Johnson because of course, they're better able to handle this type of pregnancy. So my husband, we had this huge meeting going on in Atlantic City for work. My mom was there with me and they wanted to know if I wanted them to transport me or if I was comfortable. So of course, you know, if the hospital doesn't have to transport you and they're saying a family member can transport you, you feel pretty confident that you're okay, you're safe. And I said to my husband, I said, go to your meeting, you know, go do what you do. Remember, if I go backwards, remember I said to you, I have six moms, right? Yeah. So you can imagine me now in the car with my mom and my other moms, <laughs> all of her sisters now. And that's just the way my family is because here they all show up. And that's just yeah. how my family is. We just show up in great numbers for each other. So now here I am, I'm in the car with my mom and her sisters and we're keeping my spirits high and we're all laughing and we're joking. So when we get there and he says this and I start crying, my mom is that mother bear. And she's like that mom that you can tell when she's like in protection mode because her voice drops a couple of octaves. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Real serious and real intense. (laughs) And you want to have somebody like that in your corner in these scary moments, if you can. uh, You know, she kind of takes over and she asks him to leave. Wait, she asked the doctor to leave? She asked him to leave. Good for her. Yeah. And she said, this is not what was said to my daughter. And you need to let her get her feet underneath her before coming in here and spewing all this stuff at her. She's just not mentally prepared to hear all of this right now. And I'm going to have to ask you to step out of the room so she can gain her composure. And he left and she left right behind him. So my aunts are now consoling me and my mom is out of the room and she went to get the nurse's station or to talk to the doctor. And the next thing I know, another doctor comes in and it's a female doctor and totally different, totally, totally different. She's rubbing my arm. She's telling me to calm down. She's telling me that he was the specialist, but she was the doctor that was on call and she was going to be with me for the duration of the evening. And there's some things that as doctors that need to be said, but they need to be said in a different way. And she was like, no one is going to deliver your baby tonight. No one feels that there's any reason that we should have to perform an emergency C-section. You just got here. She's like, you have to become for not only you, but for the baby. And she was just very, I mean, it just made me feel so much better and so much more at peace. And she let me hear the baby's heartbeat. And she was saying, you know, it's a very strong heartbeat. And my husband, of course, once this all happened, I immediately called him. And of course, he left his meeting and he came right away. And from that moment, he was with me for the entire time that I was in the hospital, which was probably about two months from the time I got there to when I was released to go home. So the next couple of days kind of went really quick. So I'm going to paint it for you. So this was a Thursday that this happened. Friday morning, all throughout the night, I'm being monitored. People are coming in and checking. All day Friday, people are coming, checking. My doctor comes, the specialist comes, everything is fine. Saturday morning, everybody comes in in their regular routine and checking me. And this is probably about eight o'clock in the morning. And my doctor comes back, he leaves, he comes back and he goes, I don't know how to say this to you but the baby has gone into survival mode and he's pulling from your organs because he's fighting to stay alive. It's just nature. Like he knows that there's something wrong and now he is just pulling from you to keep himself alive. The unfortunate thing is that the more that he pulls from you, he's pulling from all your organs. And he goes, and I want you to try and understand what I'm saying to you. I cannot let the baby continue to live inside you pulling from your organs because neither one of you are going to survive like that. He goes, so I'm going to perform an emergency C-section. And he goes, and I have to be completely honest with you. He goes, he's so tiny. And I was hoping that we could have stabilized you to at least 24, 26 weeks. When I saw you in freehold, that was the plan. He goes, but unfortunately, the baby has a different plan right now. And he goes, so he could possibly be born stillborn. And I have to ask you, what is it that you want me to do? And that's like the toughest question in the world to ask any mom, what do you want me to do? And I said, I want you to save him. I want you to do whatever you have to do to keep him alive. And I said, don't worry about me. And he goes, well, it doesn't work like that. (laughs) Unfortunately, he goes, it doesn't. And I'm I'm sorry, I'm tearing up right now. And I had my tissue ready. He says, it doesn't work like that, unfortunately. 
while the baby is a fetus, we have to put mom as the priority. Now, once he's born, he's a priority. But right now, you're the priority. And he goes, I'm going to do everything I can, of course. He goes, but you're my priority and you have to remain my priority. And I said, no, you do everything that you can for him. And you make sure that he's okay. And don't worry about me. I'll be okay. And when I tell you that this all happened in a span of about 15 minutes, from that conversation in 15 minutes, I was receiving an epidural, getting me prepared for this emergency C-section. As God would have it, RJ came out. He was not stillborn. This little less than a pound baby, his legs were as big as my pinky, came out kicking, his arms were moving, his legs were moving. And all I saw was a shadow of this little tiny thing being cast away. And they took my husband away. So now I'm still in the delivery room and I'm being stitched up and I'm all alone. And I'm just sitting there praying and asking God to make sure that he's okay and that nothing happens to him. And I go into recovery and I'm still in recovery alone. And mind you, Jasmine, she was in college at the time and she's at the hospital also. So she's putting my gown on before I went for the C-section and we're in the bathroom. And I know what the doctors has said to me, but this is a very crucial thing that the baby is pulling from my organs and it's crucial for both of us. And I look at her and I tell her, do you know that you're the most important thing in the world to me? And if anything happens to me, you know that I love you. And, you know, I want you to be the phenomenal woman that I've raised you to be. And she goes, Bobby, no, nothing's going to happen to you. And I said, I know it's not, but on the off chance that it does, I want you to know that I will always be with you. No matter what happens, even if I'm not physically here, I am always with you. And this poor kid had to sit outside the delivery room. While my husband was in with me, she was out there alone by herself. And when I tell you, this kid is so strong, she is amazing. And when Reggie left to go with the baby, of course, Jasmine went with him. So here I am, I'm in recovery. I'm all by myself there with the baby. And I have my phone with me and she sends me a picture that she took of RJ. And she goes, I know you didn't get to see him. She goes, but mommy, he's absolutely beautiful. And she goes, he's so active. She's like, he's been moving since he was born. She goes, we're here looking at him right now. And his legs are going and his arms are going. And all I can think is, thank God he's going to be okay. And Jasmine says, God can't do this to my mom. He would take the baby from her. I just know that he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't do this. She's been through so much. He wouldn't take him from her. And they're having this conversation. And they tell me this, you know, of course, afterwards, after I'm sane again. And the next 24 hours, the doctor tells me, Yvette, it's just going to be very crucial because he's very tiny. And he goes, but the good signs are is that, you know, he's very active, but he is very tiny. He goes, he weighs less than a pound and the next 24 hours are just going to be very crucial. And you just have to know that. And I said, okay, but here I am. I'm like a ray of sunshine right now because I'm like, you know what? He's active. He's here. He's not stillborn. He's beat all the odds. I'm still here. You know, we're good. God has blessed me. I have this son. God, you answered my prayers. And I know that you're not going to take my son from me. And I had this wonderful nurse. And she didn't know how to tell me that RJ was having some complications. I had seen him. My husband had seen him. My mom had seen him. My family had seen him. And she comes to me. This is now probably like one o'clock in the morning. And she says to me, do you want to see your son? So I said, of course I do. And she told me later, she goes, I just didn't know how to say it to you. So she was trying to give me an opportunity to see him in case something happened to him. So they wheel me downstairs and I get off the elevator And he's in like his little incubator thing. And I see all these people around him and I see, you know, people are running and moving fast and they're sticking him. And I'm thinking to myself, what's going on? You know, they told me he was okay and he was active and the doctor comes over and you know how you know it's someone's face that the news that they're about to tell you is just not good. And he says, your son is taking a turn for the worst (gasps) and we're doing everything we can, but we wanted to give you an opportunity to see him. So they wheel me over and I get to stick my hands in and I get to rub him. And as soon as I touched him, it was like his legs and arms just, you know, like he just knew that I was there and he's getting active again. And I just prayed over him and they took me back. Of course, you can't get any sleep with that on your mind. No. I mean, how did it feel to have to be pulled away from him in that moment? Oh, it was so hard. It was horrible to leave him. Like I wanted to stay there with him. I did not want to leave him. But in that moment, I knew that They needed to do what they needed to do. And I would just be in the way. And I thought that I was best served praying for him. And they took me back to my room. And I just sat there silently. All three of us, Jasmine's still there. My husband's there. And each one of us just kind of sat in our own little space in that room. And we were just quiet. 
And I prayed silently, asked God not to take him from me, that we had been through so much and he was finally here and, you know, and to just help him and, and save him and make him healthy. And within that 24 hours, they came back and they got me. They wanted me to see him again. And I would go back down, they wheel me out, get off the elevator. And this time they're moving even more quickly around him and everyone's just standing around him and they're like poking and everybody's, you know, going off. And that's all I'm seeing is like, everybody just seems like if you watch a video and you like put it on fast forward and you see everybody moving so fast, that's what it looked like to me. Yeah. And I'm just sitting in that wheelchair and I start looking at his monitor and I notice that the monitor, the numbers are going down and I'm just in my wheelchair and I'm just staring at this monitor. And I watched it go from like, I think it started, it was like at 80 something. And it just, I watched it get to zero. And when it got to zero, everybody stopped moving. And the doctor came over and he says, he got, I'm just so sorry. And I just sat in that wheelchair and it was like, I was holding my breath. And I remember Jasmine was on my right and Reggie was on my left and I couldn't breathe. And I was just still fixated on the monitor. I remember my husband, like, he seemed like his voice was so distant and it was just like that. It's okay. We're going to be okay. And everything's okay. And don't worry. And it's okay. And, and I remember him saying, we're stronger than this. And, you know, and we're going to be all right. And you're going to be okay. And I'm still holding my breath and I'm still looking at the monitor. And then Jasmine touches my shoulder and she goes, no, you can't do that to her. She goes, she, she has to cry. And she goes, mommy, it's okay. Cry, let it out. And as soon as she touched me, it was like she released all the breath and all the tears that were inside of me. And the nurse said, do you want to see your son? Do you want to hold him? And I said, yes. My husband goes, no. And I said, I do. So they wheel me to this room and they go, just give us a couple minutes because, you know, we just got to, you know, clean him up and wrap him up and then we'll bring him to you. And they brought him to me and you're talking about a, a baby that weighed less than a pound. And by the time they had wrapped him all up and took out all his tubes and everything, he looked like a six pound baby and they brought him and they put him in my arms. And when I tell you the hardest thing was giving him back because he just looked like he was sleeping, you know, and I just didn't want to give him up. I wanted to keep him. If I could have kept him and took him home with me like that, I would have. And I remember Jasmine held him. My husband never held him. He looked at him, but he didn't hold him and he couldn't. And he walked out and I just sat there and I held him. And when the nurse said I had to give him back, as soon as I had to give him back, I looked at Jasmine. I said, call my mom, I need her. She says, okay. She says, I'll call her. And she just began, like, she went into like this adult mode. I mean, this time she's probably like 21, 22. And she just started making all these phone calls. And I mean, it was like watching me and she's so strong and she's just telling everybody what's going on and she's not crying. She's just this strong little girl that I raised, you know, that I look at now like this, she's a young lady now. And my mom comes and of course, all my aunts are there <laughs> and they stayed with me the whole entire night. And the next day, I remember the doctors came in and they said my blood pressure was through the roof. Oh no. The preeclampsia, I didn't know it for like a week, gone into a pulmonary embolism. They were trying to get my blood pressure down. So, you know, so it's not enough that you've just gone through this horrific emotional experience, but then your yeah. body is also having. Yeah. Down. So my body is still severely swollen and now my blood pressure is very high and they're telling me that I have to calm down. So how do you tell a woman who just lost her son that she has to calm down? Yeah. So, and they're like, but you have to calm down because your blood pressure is just so high. You could have a stroke. You could have a seizure. You know, we have to get your blood pressure down and the more upset you get, it's raising it. So of course I have to try and channel some type of strength and energy to, you know, keep all my emotions bottled up. How do you do that? I don't even know how I did it. At this point, they're telling me I can't have any more visitors because they're feeling like the visitors are contributing to me being emotional. They're pulling um, away your support network. So they take away my mom and my aunts and tell them that they can't be there. The only person that can stay with me is Reggie. That night, of course, I hear babies crying because I'm still in maternity. Oh, God. So I start hearing these babies cry and I'm like losing my mind. And so they were like, we got to move her. We got to move her. So in the middle of the night, they just moved me to another floor because they wanted to get me out of maternity. I have all these students coming in all throughout the day. Everybody's looking at my feet. Everybody's touching me. And it's like a teaching moment that this is what it looks like when somebody has severe preeclampsia, you know? And it's like the whole time, I'm just like, are you kidding me? It's like every time they come in the room, I'm reliving what's happening all over again. Finally. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm just feeling this like re-traumatization, even watching you relive this experience many years later. 
how yeah. painful it is. And I can't imagine being in a hospital room where the doctors think that this is a good time to teach a student. They're learning on the back of your raw, horrible emotional experience. And that's how unfair. And then, of course, the students have to ask me questions. So they're asking me, do I have any pain in my chest? And, you know, all I'm thinking is I just want to go home. I just want out of here. So I'm saying no, but I do. But I want to go home. They're like, does it hurt when you breathe? And I'm going, no. But I was starting to feel tightness in my chest. Yeah. Now we're five days into this. And they're still asking me this. My blood pressure is still through the roof. I'm still the Michelin man. Because all I'm thinking is if I don't tell them about my chest pain, I get to go home. Right. And I just want to go home because I just want off this merry-go-round. Like, I just want to go home. I don't want people poking at me. I don't want to be hooked up to all these monitors. I don't want to talk about this anymore. You know what I mean? I just want to go home. But this little still voice to tell them about your chest pain. So I said, well, I have a little pain in my chest. Well, as soon as I said that, it was like, oh, okay. And then here I'm whisked down for them to do all these x-rays and chest scans. And the doctor comes in and says to Reggie, did anybody talk to you downstairs? And he says, no. And they go, Mr. Anderson, can we see you outside? And my husband is very strong. I did not see him cry through this process. He has not cried yet in front of me. Now he's walked out of the room and taken walks several times, but I have not physically seen him cry at all. And he came back in the room and he looked like he had been crying. And he looks at me and he says, I need you to get better. And I need you to get out of this bed and I need you to go home. He was like, so I need you to do everything that they're going to ask you to do. But still not telling me what's wrong. They told Reggie that I had severe preeclampsia, that I had moved into a pulmonary embolism. I had blood clots and fluid on my lungs. And if they didn't get my blood pressure stabilized, that I could have a seizure, I could have a stroke, I could die. But nobody told me. So now they start all these different medications and, you know, they have to put me on blood thinners and they're flushing fluid off my body. So now they're giving me medication that's making me have to go to the bathroom, but I can't get up and use the bathroom. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to be too graphic, but you know, yeah. they're yeah. flushing this fluid off of me at an alarming rate, but I can't physically get up. Yeah. You're in extreme physical discomfort extreme discomfort. They ended up flushing 40 pounds of fluid off of my body. I'm not a doctor, so I'm like doing the math in my head. Oh my God, that's amazing. They flushed 40 pounds of fluid off my body. And once they got the 40 pounds off, believe it or not, I was still big. And I woke up one morning and my face was so swollen that my eyes were swollen shut. So I woke up and I couldn't open my eyes. I couldn't even see. And at that point, were you scared for your health? I was scared but I just wanted to go home. And that might sound crazy to some, you know what I mean? Like, didn't you want to stay there for them to heal you? But all I knew is that the longer I stayed there, the more I'm just reminded of what happened to me. And I just want to remove myself from that situation at any cost. I feel trapped. And then of course, I finally went home after two months of this. I went home on blood thinners. And I still had fluid and blood clots on my lungs. And I got home and believe it or not, home was worse than the hospital. Oh no. And is that because you had done some preparations for him or? Yeah. So my husband and I, in preparing, once we found out, I got pregnant in October. We bought a house in August. And mind you, this is now February that all this is happening. So I didn't even get to unpack all the boxes in our new home, because the reason we moved was to move closer to my mom because she was retired and she was going to be my babysitter and she was going to care for RJ. And so the house was just built. It was around RJ. So we have this place set in the backyard. We made sure we got a house with a pool. He has a nursery. You know, the family we bought the house from had two twins. So the room was already decorated. You know, the paint was already there for a baby. Yeah. So his room is right outside my room. I'm imagining how triggering that was, you know, to see this life that you had envisioned. Yeah. Where I thought is my safe haven. If I could just get there, I'm going to feel better. And we pull in the driveway and my yard is wrought iron fence. So I can see into my backyard. So we're in the driveway. And the first thing I see is this playground and streams of tears are just rolling down my cheek as we're getting out of the car and we're walking into the house. And I have to go up the stairs. And as I'm walking up the stairs, I'm thinking, 
everything I thought when I purchased this house isn't going to happen. Nobody's running down these stairs. There's not going to be a baby. The things that I'm and thinking about when we were buying the house, like I'm going to be calling you from the kitchen. Then as I'm going up the stairs, I'm thinking none of this is happening. None of this is going to happen, unfortunately. And then I get to the top of the stairs and there's his room. And my husband had the door closed and I walked past it. I didn't open the door. I walked past and I go in my room and I'm thinking, what's in there? Yeah. Do we keep that door closed forever? You know, like, what do I do with that room now? Yeah. And when I tell you that my husband was so phenomenal through this whole entire process, he was so supportive in the hospital. For your listeners that have gone through anything similar to this or just even, you know, had a baby, there are times, you know, where even if you didn't lose your child, you're just like, oh, I don't want you in here. Like, give me a little privacy. Like, you're in pain, you have stitches, but you still just want to handle it all yourself. And when I tell you my husband was in the bathroom with me and I was at the lowest moment that I could ever be. And I'm dragging an IV, you know, I have stitches from my C-section. I am huge. I can't do anything pretty much for myself. I don't want the nurses helping me. I don't want him helping me, but I clearly need help. And he goes, I got you and I'm here with you. And when I tell you that my husband did things that no man could ever have to do. For <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you know, there's so much about this story and I'm trying not to interject with questions in the way no, that I sometimes do. do. Please do. Because there's, it's an important story to have told in its completion. But one of the themes that I'm hearing from you is just how incredibly well supported you are by yeah. your aunts and your moms and daughter and your husband and how miraculous that is. You know, not everyone gets to have that, but how how special. I'm also, if you don't mind me asking, you consistently mentioned a conversation, an ongoing conversation you've had with God around what to name your organization, around keeping you safe, keeping the baby safe. And then I witnessed as we talked about the really, really, really hard stuff of your story, the conversation got a little quieter or you mentioned it a little less frequently. What were you saying to God or to yourself in those Uh, moments? Okay. So God and I had a very hard conversation at one point. And when Reggie and I got home, we kind of retreated to separate places. And because we were both grieving differently. Yeah. My husband grieves in the way that everything's okay. We're bigger than this. We're stronger than this. We can get through this. He plays sports. So everything for him is a win-lose. So he's always we're winning, we're winning, we're winning. No matter what happens, we're winning. And me, I'm very emotional, you know, I'm very spiritual and I deal with things differently than he does. So in that moment, I was very angry with God. And it took me a long time to admit that. I was very angry with God because I had trusted, I had believed, and I needed answers and I wanted to know why. Why did this happen? I feel like I'm a good person. So I needed to know. I try and live a good life. I try and follow you know, what it is that you want me to do or what, who you want me to be. And you let this happen to me. Like, this is not what the outcome was supposed to be. You took me through seven years of this and I trusted and believed and I prayed and I knew, you know, that you promised me a son. So what happens? And Reggie would go to work and I'd be in a fetal position and he'd be like, Yvette, I need you to get up today. You have to get up. You know, you got to get up. You got to move around. You can't lay in this bed. And he was being so supportive. But all I could hear is, I can't do what I want to do and you don't understand me. So leave me alone. And that's how I was for a while. And they had given me like this little box and it had RJ's belongings in it. It had his bracelets. It had his thermometer. It had his hat. It had his little sweater that they had on him. It had his blanket, his name tag. Like I got all these things in this box. And now this is my son in this box, you know? And what do I do with this box, you know? Because you gave me this box and to me, this is him. This is all I have of him. This is my son in this box. And Reggie would go to work and I'd go in my closet and I would sit on the floor. And I don't even think they even know that I did this. And it probably sounds crazy. And the box, anybody that's gone through this probably has gotten the same box. And it's like, it's not this ugly box. You know, it's a box that someone has made. It's kind of like one of those old fashioned albums that like your grandmother or something had where it (laughs) it has fabric and ribbon and, you know, (laughs) you have to untie it to open it. And every day I would go in the closet and I would undo the ribbon, open the box, take everything out, look at it, hold it, smell it, touch it, talk to it. And I honestly felt, Julia, like I was losing my mind. And this one day I went to do it 
And I sat in my closet and I was crying and I'm holding this sweater and this hat. And it's like, almost like I had, don't remember for sure, but it felt like I must've had like everything in the box in my hands and I'm clinging to them. And I just let out this loud scream and Reggie's at work. And I said, God, I'm losing my mind and I need you to help me understand what happened because I am very mad right now. And I'm so angry with you because I don't get it. I don't understand it. And you promised me. And I'm just sitting there and I'm weeping, Julia, and I'm holding all these things. And it was like this voice was like, I gave you what you asked me for. You asked me for a son and I gave you a son. And I'm thinking, oh, you really are losing your mind. Yeah. You really are losing it, sister. And I said, but you didn't because you took him. And he said, I gave that to you because you trusted me and because you believed me. I gave you the desire of your heart, but that's not what I had for you. He couldn't stay. And I'm thinking to myself, now what do I do with that? Yeah. What do I do with that information? I got this box. This is my son. And I got the fact that you just gave him to me and took him because I asked you for it and I trusted you for it. So you just let me have it for a minute. And how does that answer feel for you now? And now I get it. In that moment, I was still angry. That didn't do anything for me. I can still see being angry now too. I just, that response, so raw and so powerful. And thank you for sharing it. How does one live with a response like that for the years that you have? So, you know, I put everything back in the box. I hide the box underneath. I have shoes in my closet. I put it back underneath the shoe box and I go back to my fetal position and I'm just crying. And I'm thinking that still just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. And I have a very close friend of mine. Her name is Adrian, And we've been friends since childhood. And we always say that we're spiritually connected to each other. And whenever anything goes on in our lives, we talk it out. We pray it out. We hear from God on it. And she called me a day or so after that message. And she says that I need to talk to you and Reggie, but I need to talk to you together. I didn't share with her, you know, the message that I had gotten. And she says to me, God spoke to me about you and Reggie and RJ. And she goes, and that's what I want to talk to you about. And I said, tell me. And we're sitting on my couch in my family room. And she's sitting in this chair in my family room. And she's like facing, looking at both of us. And she said, today, when I was washing my face, She said, I felt like I had been sucked into a mirror and it was like pages of things flashed before me. She was like, and then it was like, now go tell them. And she was, but so many things had passed by me. And I said, how can I tell them all of that? Like, they're going to think I'm crazy. She goes, and all I got was go tell them. And she'll start here today to tell you. And she said, God wanted me to let you know that RJ is with him. And it had to be that way because he has something that he needs you to do. And she says, both of you are going to have to do it together. And he's going to let you know what it is. But RJ's life is not in vain. It's going to serve a big purpose. And I was like, okay. Later the next day, Reggie's at work and I'm sitting and it made me like get up and go downstairs. Like I'm trying to figure out now, process all these things. You told me that I had this son, you know, you gave me the desire of my heart, but that's not what you had for me. Adrian comes and tells me, you know, that Reggie and I have to do something together. RJ's life has big purpose and I'm sitting and I hear this voice say, I need you to feed the homeless. Wow. It's going to be a cold winter and I need you to feed the homeless. This organization is so intricately tied to your soul's purpose, like what you were meant to do in this world. What I was born to do. And Julia, the crazy thing is that if you go back to when we first started and I told you that my grandfather, he was very instrumental in the community. He was always helping people. And he always taught us to help anyone we could. And now that I fast forward, I feel like I'm completing the legacy of what he left behind. Isn't it amazing how sometimes, just sometimes, you can look back on the really, really crappy parts of your life and say, oh my God, all the dots connect, (laughs) right? And like- Four. Right. And the reason it might be preachy is because if you're in the moment, you can't see it. You can't see it. And when I tell you my faith is so strong and I was in a very bad, dark place during all of this. Sure. And I had lost faith. You know, I don't want to admit that, but it is what it is. And 
I use this as a testimony for someone else that you can be in these places, you know? Can I ask you two follow-up questions? Now that you sit here, having gone through this, I mean, I've been bawling listening to you. (laughs) I had to tell your listeners, she's been crying right along with me. (laughs) I I have. I've been silent and just like ugly crying, like snart in my shirt kind of thing. (laughs) But so there's two questions I have. One is, if you're going through this, what can you offer to somebody who might be experiencing this right now? Do you have any suggestions, feedback, thoughts? From someone who you just heard lost her faith, was in a closet, felt like she was losing her mind, thought that she would never smile again. She would never be happy again. That's just not true. And those are the things that I believe, you know, and this is just what I believe, that the enemy would love for us to stay in that dark place, would love for us to feel defeated, would love for us to feel like God isn't for us, doesn't have us. I am living proof that that's just not so, that you will smile again and you will laugh again. And it's like with anything that we go through in life, this is by far probably one of the hardest things that I've ever had to go through in my life. And when you feel like I'm never going to smile again, God can give you a new song to sing. He can give you joy. He can take away that pain if you allow him to. And when you're going through it, you don't want to hear that. You know what I mean? Because it's so much easier to stay in the fetal position, crying, feeling sorry for yourself that I'm the only person that this has happened to. And that's not just losing a child, you know, that can be losing a marriage, that can be losing a loved one, you know what I mean? There's so many other things that can happen in your life that can devastate you, just like what I went through, you know what I mean? One shouldn't be measured more significant than another. It's what you feel. I tell you that I was there and I thank God that he allowed me to scream out that morning. You know what I mean? And be real because I wasn't being real, that I am losing my mind. I'm depressed. I'm sad. And I don't understand. And I don't know what's going on. And that brings me to my second question, because this conversation has been deeply rooted in faith, a connection to God. And not everyone feels the same level of faith or has a sense of connection. You talk to people who are navigating a hardship without that faith. Do you have any thoughts? I would say, don't be alone. Don't do what I did. Don't lay in the fetal position. Don't shut people out. Allow those that you have around you, you know what I mean, to help you, to talk to you. It's okay to cry. It's okay to let it out. It's okay to admit defeat. It's okay to say, I'm losing my mind. It's okay You know what I mean? To just say, I don't need you to say anything to me. Just sit here and let me cry. That's something that I wish that I would have done, that I would have allowed my husband. I just need you to sit here with me and let me cry. You know, that's Um, powerful. And I think that sometimes we don't realize that even just having someone there with you is support enough. It's support enough to know that I'm not alone, that you're here with me. That's so beautiful. Well, so I want to close. It's very hard to close this conversation because, <laughs> because you you're so it all. <laughs> no, no, because what you're offering is so important and yeah. I want to keep pushing on the raw spots. And it's okay. Um, I am okay to revisit it. You know, it's emotional, but I can honestly say that I'm okay talking about it. Sometimes I talk about it and I'm very happy talking about it. I guess in this conversation, what makes me emotional, Julia, is knowing that there are listeners that have gone through this. So they know what I'm feeling, you know, and it's emotional to know that someone has to go through what I went through. And I don't wish that on anyone. And that makes me emotional because I don't want anybody to ever experience what I experienced. I truly don't want to see anyone go through that. And I guess it makes me emotional that this simple conversation can maybe help someone down the road, but it makes me feel good to share it. Because like I said, I want this to be my testimony that you will smile again and you will be happy again. And a lot of the times people say that Reggie and I took tragedy and turned it into triumph. We took it and we turned it into a service mission. And we did. We honor RJ every year. And that's hard in itself to go shopping for children. You know, in the beginning, it was very hard to birth a project like RJ's Toy Chest. 
and have all these children in need, all these different ages. But I think that that was my therapy because now I not only have this one kid that I would have spoiled, I have 1900 children that I get to spoil. (laughs) That's amazing. (laughs) And I get to do it in my son's name. So his memory, how tiny and fleeting it was, is so big right now because his name is in places that he never got to even walk into. You know what I mean? RJ's toy chest is this huge project that yields so much love and brings so much joy to so many that makes me feel good. And that's my joy. What an amazing legacy. So if we want to know more about your organization and about you, where do we find you? You can find us on Anderson's. It's A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N-S at the end meettheneed.org. It's andersonsmeettheneed.org is our website. And then MTN organization is is Instagram. Instagram. And Facebook is Meet the Need. I loved talking to you. This was awesome. Thank you for allowing me to do this. This was huge therapy for me. And for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're going to help a lot of people with this. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you for listening to Storked with your host, Julia Carroll. This podcast is changing the conversation around the ways people define and create family. If you like what you hear, please support us by sharing with friends and following on Instagram at Storked underscore podcast. We also always appreciate it when you rate and review us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. For more information, visit storkedpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter. That's S-T-O-R-K-D podcast.com. I am thrilled to share and extend a free level two subscription to the California Cryobank donor catalog by using the promo code STORKED, that's S-T-O-R-K-D, at cryobank.com. You will receive free access for 90 days, which is on a $145 value.